Welcome to the More Gem Show. Tonight we're featuring stones of Africa, uh, primarily Tanzania, which I do travel to fairly regular. We should have been there at this time of the year, but uh, of course everybody's stuck at home. Um, so the, uh, the stones that we're showing you tonight uh, come from not only Tanzania, we have opals from Ethiopia, we have stones from Zimbabwe, Namibia, uh, Mozambique, uh, Africa is our primary source and our travel to Tanzania has been a very important part of our business because Tanzanite is a very strong part of our business. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, how I buy Tanzanite in Tanzania. Um, the trip to uh, Tanzania takes you to Kilimanjaro Airport, which is uh, Kilimanjaro is, is right there you look out and it's huge in front of you you know we go to stay in arusha arusha is the nearest town but actually the mines are closer to uh, the airport than arusha is to the mines or the airport it's about an hour and a half trip to get out to the mines from our hotel in arusha um, when we go there it's a dirt road and a very scenic uh, no, none of the, the wild animals that you expect in Tanzania. They're about an hour and a half the other direction. Uh, but there's lions and elephants and rhinos and crocodiles are all there. So it's a cool place to go because Arusha is where everybody that goes on safari, this is where they stay because it's so close to the, the Serengeti. Um, but the other direction to the mines, um, is really a beautiful trip also and uh, I've gone there several times I go down in the mines um, questionable to do that uh, a little scary for most I think but uh, it's just an opportunity to see just how things are mined and and uh, so I've got a friend that's there Sunni um, is a good friend and owns one of the mines so I can go there and we'll sit there at his mine and and buy stones from from the local miners and and from the other mine owners so it's a great trip and we also go to Marilani which is where the the miners live and uh, go there and just sit on the street and and buy stones from the miners that's how it was things are changing and I'll describe that to you later but uh, the mine that I go to is uh, down about 1,200 meters is how far they're down and uh, <clears throat> very sporadic production. Uh, they've only hit major twice and uh, it's probably been three years since they hit anything there. Uh, but buying there is extraordinary. I mean, it's just a lot of fun to do and, you know, I get to the, the buy material and, and bring it back here and cut and um, it, it's just a great trip to go to Tanzania. Hope to get there again, but like I say, things have changed. And uh, let me show you where all the buying is now. And that's back in Arusha. So this is Arusha, and this is where a, a lot of the dealers are. And, and I've dealt here in the past also, uh, another good place to buy. But now everything is back in Arusha. You know, what the government has done is they've uh, forced everybody to deal out of one building, um, and, and that's to enable them to get the tax that's been avoided for all these years. So now the, the one building is where everybody is, and, and it'll probably make it easier for me to buy, uh, just being right in Arusha by your hotel. And so, so things hopefully will be easy. I don't think the buying will be quite as good. But what this has done for particularly this show is it produced a huge quantity of goods all of a sudden that hit the market. You know, the problem with uh, what what happened in November is they started jailing people for selling on the streets. What I was doing in Marilani and at the mines, you'd be thrown in jail for now. So there's no more of that. You have to buy in this one building. Um, so before that, which was in November, a large quantity of goods left the country um, because people didn't want to pay the tax or whatever. 
you know, they would be jailed if, if they didn't claim the material that they had. So it forced a lot of material out of the country. So we were able to buy a, a large quantity of goods and just extremely fine material. It's like all this material that people had put away that they wanted to save all of a sudden came out of the country. So you're going to see some of those stones tonight. Um, just some extraordinary tanzanite. Um, I, I think you're going to love what you're going to see tonight. Let's fly back to the shop. I've got some things I want to show you. So after I finish cutting tanzanite, we have to heat them. And this is our oven. Um, we heat the stones to 1,075 degrees Fahrenheit. And it takes a full day. Uh, raise the temperature slowly, take it down slowly. And uh, this is cooled off. I've got four stones in there that are part of our show today. Um, and so they're in this vial. Uh, we use uh, investment is a is a casting compound that we use to keep the temperature from uh, increasing too quickly. So let's pour these out, and I'm expecting some very high quality stones out of here. You won't be able to see them well till we clean them off, but you'll see them at the show. You know, let's see. And I, I can see the colors just extraordinary, as expected. Hopefully uh, there's no heat damage, which occasionally happens. But these were clean stones, and, and they should uh, be just fine and, and just incredible color. And uh, I'll clean them up, and we'll see them shortly. And the other feature tonight is the Ethiopian opals. And here's uh, some of the rough material. from blacks to just some beautiful white opal. These are just very nice pieces. Uh, this, this we showed you last week, which was the uh, limb cast. So these are future opals, but the ones I'm going to show you tonight, you're going to see some really amazing opals. So again, welcome and let's go to the show. Hi everybody. Welcome to the More Gem Show. I'm your host, Steve Moriarty, and with me tonight are my son, Michael, who's in charge of production, and my other son, Jeffrey, who is our chat moderator. Say hello, Jeff. How are we doing, everybody? Hey, guys. So if you have questions, uh, just put them on chat, and we'll answer as many questions as possible tonight. Um, so tonight, I've got 21 stones to show you. Um, more than half of those I've cut. I've had plenty of time to cut during this pandemic. Uh, so I've got some beautiful stones cut. And you're going to see some really extraordinary stones tonight. These are some of the best stones I own. Um, many of them new from, from this cutting and from the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. So the first stone I want to show you is, uh, is this opal. Uh, this opal weighs 81 carats, so it's one of the biggest I've ever seen or ever owned. Um, it is a crystal opal, and I'll show you, try and show you what that means. Uh, let's see. So crystal opal just means you can see through it. It's it's high transparency, so you can see how how visually you can just see right through it. Top crystal opal is what the Australians consider to be the best opal. And this just has remarkable colors. I mean, it has every color of the rainbow. You know, we're kind of blowing the camera out a little bit with the blues that are in this because they're just so vivid that they, the camera lens can't quite handle it. Um, but uh, this stone, as big as it is, it, it uh, has a, a, um, an appraised price of 22700 You know, if this were an Australian stone, I'm thinking more like 40000 kind of money for something this big. Um, our price on it is 11300 And tonight, 
if you use the uh, coupon code uh, GEMSHOW2, because this is our second GEM Show, which we will have these every Wednesday night, uh, you'll get an extra 15% off the price that's on here. So 11003 will be discounted by 15%. And just one comment about uh, what our appraised prices are. Uh, this is based on this publication. It's done by Richard Drucker. Uh, it's the GEM Guide. And it is a market-driven, independent pricing guide where they go to all the major shows and they price stones at the shows. And then they create a guide for us that actually um, breaks down the stones by weight and by quality and, and gives us a price and, and uh, a relationship to how we should uh, appraise these. So this magazine is used worldwide. Uh, by people just trying to understand what the price of colored gems are because it's a very difficult market to understand. So, so that's the, the price I'm giving you here, 227. That That's based on, on the, the gem guide. So just take another look at this though. And I mean, I mean, it really, really an incredible piece. Uh, it's just totally clean other than this little divot here on the back of the stone. It's just completely clean throughout the stone. Just an amazing piece, 81 carats. So our next stone is a tanzanite. And this one's unusual because it's natural. I mean, this stone is as it came out of the ground. Um, probably 95% or greater uh, of all tanzanite that you see are enhanced by heating. Uh, this stone will enhance if I heat it uh, like we did uh, in the video. And, and it would come out to be an incredible stone. But, you know, this is one of the few that shows these beautiful dichroic colors. The, the pleochrism that you see. You know, what's on the end is what they call diesel, and that's, that's what the rough kind of looks like, this diesel reddish, bluish brown color. And then you get that blue down the center. Uh, most pieces of rough that you cut and the natural, they, they're not this pretty, they're mostly brown. Um, but this stone just has a beautiful color in its natural state. And there are no other gems that look like this. The only thing close probably is uh, andalusite, uh, which will show strong pleochroism like this. Andalusite's very difficult. I haven't had an andalusite in probably 10 years, but it is probably the only other stone with any semblance of, of, uh, of this kind of look. So we're going to keep it natural. The stone will be natural till it sells and natural until the, unless the owner decides he wants me to heat it for him, but that'd be a crime because look at the beauty of this stone. Just really a great stone. Um, like I say, most of them I don't keep natural, just because they're just not this pretty and they have the potential to be beautiful when you heat them, you get that natural blue purple color. Um, this is uh, this is a natural crystal. This is really a great natural crystal and is actually available on uh, Michael's website, which is uh, uh, mineralmike.com. He sells mineral specimens, and this is one of the finest tanzanites that I, I've seen. You know, just really nice crystal shape. It's a twin. You can see the other crystal on, on the side here. Just a, a really a, a perfect crystal shape. Uh, this stone is included enough that we can't cut it, or I'd probably be hacking it up, but um, it is a great specimen. So, so that tanzanite weighs 2.93 carats. Uh, the appraised value is 2,900. Our price normally would be 1,490. And again, if you use the coupon code GEMSHOW2, you're gonna get an extra 15% off that. And the next stone we have is a pink tourmaline. Now, th this is from Mozambique. Uh, it's a Cuprian pink tourmaline. You know, the first one I've ever had. I, I bought this from a gentleman uh, 
uh, that's a cutter in Madagascar that I got my aquas from. And cuprian just means there's copper in it. Uh, the, the most famous of these is Periba tourmaline. Periba tourmaline is green to kind of blue-green. And because of the copper, it just has a glow to it that makes it worth 30000 a carat at times. So it is one of the most expensive of the tourmalines. That's not the case with this, but um, doesn't have the glow that copper causes, uh, but it just has a really perfect pink color. I mean, I, I've, it's been a long time since I had a tourmaline that was this nice of pink. Uh, usually there's a peachy brown colored to them or they're more purple. This one's just pink. Now, as you look at the video, you're going to see some inclusions, um, but in person, they're just very difficult to see. You know, when you take a picture with a, a macro lens and bright lighting, you see everything that's in it. There are some stones like emeralds and, and a lot of the spessor type garnets. I just cannot photograph them. They look good in person, but they look horrible on, on the screen. And, you know, you're just not going to see these inclusions in person. You're just going to see the beautiful pink color that this, this stone has. Again, this comes from Mozambique. Um, tourmaline's a, a good tough stone that you can wear in a ring or pendants, uh, earrings, pretty much any type of jewelry. Uh, this stone weighs 2.44 carats. Uh, the appraised price is $1,560. $780 is our price. And of course, with the Gem Show 2 coupon code that you're going to use. Um, you'll get an extra 15% off that. So for a nice tourmaline, this is a very reasonable stone. And up next is a stone I just finished. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We have a viewer question. Uh, yeah, what's the question there, Jeff? Um, two. First one, can you just show the tourmaline against your skin? Tourmaline to against my how, skin. How much okay. lotion you use? How it, how it looks against a pale, pale Swedish Irish skin. All right. So it still looks nice, and you know this. My skin's pretty pink, but uh, this stone still shows up well. If you don't like it against your skin, skin wear a black turtleneck. I don't know. It's, it's just a pretty stone. And what was the other question? Okay, and the other question is, Mary wants to know, you know, we talked about, you talked about Tanzania, um, you know, getting stones there. Is there any place uh, in the U.S. that you travel to, to the mines and facet stones from? Yes, uh, the Sunstone Mines, me and Jeff and Michael um, went out to the, the Oregon Sunstone Mines. Uh, there are several stones that I've cut on the website uh, we've sold quite a few of them, and I need to get back to cutting them because it's interesting stone, but very, very difficult to cut. Uh, they most of them have uh, um, strong pleochroic colors from one direction. It can look green, and the other direction it's orange. Uh, so it creates a lot of difficulty in in the cutting of it. A lot of times it'll mix and be more of a brownish, greenish, pink stone. Um, but I see a lot of new cutting styles coming up, particularly the fantasy cuts that seem to be working well. And I'm going to get back to cutting those. Uh, we've also went to the um, Nevada um, opal mines, you know, but that material is not cuttable because it'll craze on you. But we had a great time on, on both those trips. You know, and we'll we'll try and do some more. I have cut the quartz from from Arkansas from a trip I took down there. Uh, been there a couple times, once by myself, once with Michael, and we did really well. And and bought some quartz down there. I cut it. I cut uh, a 570 carat stone. Um, that we've done a complete video on that cutting. Uh, that stone sold and actually sold for about three thousand dollars. So uh, for a hunk of clear quartz that really looked like a diamond. I mean, it really came out great, you know, but 570 carats, you know, bigger than any diamond that's ever been cut. But quartz is more common, you know, so uh, you can see that uh, on YouTube also. Any other questions there, Jeff? Uh, 
one one just came in um so this so is it a definitive or blended junction is a definitive or blended junction more desirable with a bicolor tourmaline does that make sense uh, sure um it is but not totally important i mean it, the importance is the how strong the color is what the colors are um and that there's a significant amount of whatever the secondary color is a 50 perfect 50 50 split with a nice definition and really strong colors would be great but you don't see that that often so they all have beauty on their own and you know you look at it if you think it's a beautiful stone it's worth owning and um but the perfect definitive 50 50 split should bring more money but not necessarily so i mean it's more on the color um than just the overall look of the stone so our next stone is a citrine um this is kind of unique just the cut this cut was designed uh by his initials a v viric hopefully i pronounce that right um, and I, I cut this stone, I've cut it twice, just because it's just kind of a cool look. You know, there's several designs for this style of cut, the eye of the pharaoh, eye of, this is the eye of the sun. Um, just a, a nice shape, uh, the brilliance works really well, and, and because of the way it's cut, that central table facet shows up real well, so it gives it that eye appearance. Um, this citrine will make a, a great pendant. It's a nice size for a pendant. Uh, and, and it just shows really good reflection. I mean, it's a nice, brilliant stone. And this material is really intense color. I haven't quite seen this intense of a, of a greenish-yellow color in citrine from Brazil in the past. Um, but, but it is really a, a, a cool stone. Need a... There's a cloth, a little finger printed up, but um, so we're using an iPhone as our secondary camera here, and you know it, it's not perfect. Uh, you can more trust the what I do in the studio, but um, it it works pretty good. Yeah, so you can see uh, just a really nice brilliance. This stone, this stone is completely flawless. There's nothing in it. You know, a nice big stone. It weighs 32.94 carats, uh, over an inch long. Uh, the stone appraises $1,120. Our price is $690. You know, it probably took me seven hours to cut. So I think I made less than my plumber on this one. But, hey, it's, uh, it's fun to do, even though quartz is uh, just very difficult at times to polish. Uh, actually, for a common stone, it's one of the most more difficult stones, uh, gives people more problems than probably any other stone. Here's a piece of rough. So this has actually been worked on a little bit. You know, this isn't the natural faces of the stone. Kind of a broken piece. You can see this was broken off the rock that it formed on and no real crystal shape to it. But you can see the color and another nice clean piece. Uh, next up, we have a tanzanite, and let me let me show you a, a little tool that that if you're really into gems and you're gonna buy more gems and you want to be able to identify gems, this is this is probably the first tool you should buy just because it's cheap and and it'll separate a lot of stones. It's a dichroscope. It's, this is a calcite dichroscope, and what it does for you, it will. In a dichroic stone, meaning a show, stone that has two colors, um, when you look at it and you do it by holding this to your eye and looking through the stone up at a light, you're going to see two windows in the stone. And those windows in a dichroic stone are going to be two different colors and you probably need to rotate it a few times, look at it different directions, because there's always one direction that has only one color in both windows so if you look for the two colors um, it can be indicative of what the material is uh, tanzanite which is this next stone coming up is trichroic 
uh, when before it was cut in the rough, it had three colors. So trichroic, it was blue, purple, and yellow. Um, so showing three colors. But once it's heated, it's only going to show two colors, the blue and the purple in, in this, this scope. So this is something you can buy on Amazon. It's a, it's a dichroscope. I think it's 29 bucks, you know, and it, it's a very helpful tool. When I travel, there's one in my pocket all the time. You know, I always have pocket tools and it's a loop. It's a dichroscope uh, are two important tools. You know, I do take a refractometer with me at times because it's a real important piece of equipment. And hopefully next week I'll review a, 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 a refractometer that I've ordered. I don't know when it'll come here. It's probably coming from China. Um, and and it was 68 bucks. You know, I had one for 99 bucks. Had a built-in light. Worked fine. And I took it on many trips. But the light uh, eventually burn out and, and you can't replace it. So this one has a separate light to it that's coming. And, and hopefully you can just replace the light then. And the, the equipment will always be good. So this next stone is uh, our most popular cut. It's a Portuguese round, and Portuguese round has 161 facets, so it's kind of tedious to cut. There are five rows of 16 facets on the top and the same on the bottom. So a bit time consuming, but the effect is outstanding. You know, people love the way this stone looks, and these tanzanites don't last long. I mean, I just cut this, and um, it's, it's not to be around long. Hopefully tonight it'll go, because it really is a remarkable stone. There is one little inclusion, which you can see right there, um, off to the edge, but no effect on the durability of the stone. You can't see it set. You can only see it from the side with strong lighting. Um, so it's an SI1 graded stone, which is the clarity. And I can go into our grading system because most of these stones will have um, an overall quality grade. You know, this is a system that I've developed recently. Uh, I worked with uh, an investor in Tanzanite for a while that was an engineer. And through our talks, I, I finally sat down and figured out with, with him um, just how to grade stones. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult thing that nobody really does well, and hopefully the system will work out for us. Uh, it, it actually forces me to um, spend more time with the stone because I actually grade, like these tanzanites, I'll grade in daylight and incandescent. And when I do that, I put a number on it. Uh, everything's one to a thousand. So I grade the, the daylight color and the incandescent color and put a thousand grade on each, add them up, divide by two, and that gives me a color grade. Then I do clarity grading. And as I was talking about this, an SI1 stone on, on this tanzanite, um, this is the GIA system of grading that's used for diamonds. It's what people understand, so I've gone with that. GIA does a little bit different in that they break colored stones down into three categories, one, two, and three. One are stones that are usually clean, two are stones that often have a little bit of inclusion, and three are stones that are always included. You know, the threes would include the emeralds, and that pink tourmaline I showed you is a class three stone. So it gives you a, a little handicap. Uh, so an SI1 stone in a, in a one category, which would be this tanzanite, is graded just like a diamond is. In a three category, you kind of bump the, the quality, you give it a handicap. And uh, so uh, an SI in a three grade actually has more inclusions. You know, it's, it's GIA system of, of color grading. So I give that a thousand, one to a thousand grading. And then I also grade the cut, and I break that down into three or four separate uh, categories. And that's the uh, brilliance of the stone, the symmetry of the stone, the actual cutting, and the polish. Give a thousand grade to all four of those categories, add them up, divide by four, and gives me a, a cut grade. 
I add that cut grade with the clarity grade and the color grade and divide it by three and that's what the overall quality grade. And this particular stone is a 915 and what affected it most was the SI1 clarity of the stone. So that's, that's what the number you're going to see on our website is all about. Not all stones are graded yet, but uh, we will try and do all stones. I have a viewer question, and what is it, Jerry? Jeff? Okay, I've got a few on this one. Okay. Um, before we get into it, you know, this is one of my favorite cuts, but is now I know we did one before that I believe went viral on Reddit. Yes. Is this the yeah. same cut? No, it's or? the same cut, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was like a six carat. Six carat, okay. Yeah. So so this was a, a viral viral cut yeah, gemstone. I, yeah. yeah, just the cut, you know, people looked at it and you just everybody loves it. You know, it's just very popular cut. You just don't get many stones that have the right depth and the right shape, particularly in Tanzanite, to be able to cut this cut. You know, that big citrine I showed you, I could cut those Portuguese all day long. Uh, just because you don't worry about wasting the material because it's inexpensive material. But when you're dealing with tanzanite, if it is going to be an oval, you know, it's going to cost you a, an extra carat to cut it to this Portuguese. So you, you cut what the, the stone says in in rare materials like, like tanzanite. So getting a Portuguese round tanzanite doesn't come along real often. And, and with the Portuguese cut, a few people asked two questions. How many um, facets are on it and how long did it take you? 161. Depends on the material like this Portuguese. It, it always takes longer just because of the number of the facets. You know, a typical uh, round brilliance, you know, a round brilliant diamond has 57 or 58 facets. Um, so it, and it takes almost as long to cut each facet. So you got three times the amount of facets, so it's three times the amount of time if it was the same material. And it's not quite that bad because the facets on, on the Portuguese are small, so they tend to polish a little quicker. The smaller the facet, the, the less time it takes. But it's for sure double the time to a Portuguese as it would be around. So th that stone's probably five hours is, is what it is. Okay. So. All right. And just last question, I know we're going to be talking about Tanzanite a little bit tonight. Um, somebody was asking a question, I guess it's from somebody we're actually doing a ring for, um, but they were wondering, good accent stones um, for Tanzanite. Oh, what? Are... For good accent stones with Tanzanite? Oh, well, we've, we've done remarkably well with Savorite. Savorite always seems to work. The first time somebody asked me to do that, I just kind of, mm, Savorite, good bright green and the blue and we put it together and wow remarkable and and we've sold many many pieces with savorite we've just done some recently with demantoid garnet um, it is green it's a lighter green um, and we've only done them recently because i've never had demantoid available you know and now there's material coming out of madagascar so demantoid has a very bright color it's a has strong dispersion, which is break up a white light in the spectral colors. So it makes a unique piece also. Uh, we've done ruby. Um, we've done many, many colors. I personally have difficulty perceiving the beauty of the mixed colors um, until it's put together. I mean, and, and it is some of the first things that we sell. We never have enough color combinations set up. Um, it's just very popular with the public. You know, I have a hard time envisioning it myself. Fortunately, there's others here like Chris, our designer, who doesn't have the same difficulties I have. But um, it, it is very, very popular and we'll do a lot more of it and, um, in the future. So back to the stone. It's a three carat 77, which is a nice size. And just look at the beauty of that stone. You know, it has red flash. It has everything going for it, just an intense color. Um, the appraised value is thirty five hundred and eighty bucks. Our price twenty three sixty, and of course, Gem Show Two will get you fifteen percent. Our next stone is a Sphene. Sphene, not very well known in the business, but for us, very saleable. Uh, it's unique. Sphene is also known as titanate, is the mineral. Sphene is, uh, is the gem material. 
what's remarkable about Sphene, uh, when we talk about diamond, diamond is known for its high dispersion. But Sphene blows it away. Uh, Sphene's dispersion is much higher than what a diamond is. Uh, the dispersion is, we know it commonly as fire, and what it is is the breakup of white light into spectral colors. And Sphene does it very, very well. Um, if we catch this right, uh, you'll see the, the different colors that, uh, that the stone displays. So that's what makes Sphene important. Um, it, in this round, it's extremely brilliant also because it has really high refractive index. The refractive index, you know, I talked about refractometer and, and that's our most important instrument to identify gems. And the only way it's helpful is because, the refractometer that is, because it won't show a number with this because it's above the capabilities of a refractometer to read. This bends light so much um, that it's getting close to what diamond is. And, and the reason diamond is as popular as it is is because of this high refractive index. It's what determines brilliance. And this is an extremely brilliant stone and also has extreme dispersion. So it's really a remarkable material. Uh, when I was traveling to Madagascar, um, Sphene was discovered late in my travels there. I started to travel in 2001 to Madagascar, um, brought there by a friend, Tom Cushman. Thanks, Tom. It was uh, a remarkable place. Uh, Madagascar, probably my favorite place on the planet. Uh, as I mentioned last year, I, I went to school and graduated as a biologist and in Madagascar, 75% of everything living, plant and animal, only comes from there. So if you want to see all the animals on Earth, you definitely have to go to, go to Madagascar to see such unusual animals. Um, but Sphene was found there while I was traveling and was available in remarkable sizes, beautiful stones. But that supply has pretty much depleted, very difficult to get now. But as happens often in this trip, uh, one stone goes out of existence in a, pretty, in, a, in a country and all of a sudden another, another country out of the blue just starts producing and that's the case with Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe just started uh, producing this material um, just in the last few years. The first time, first time that, uh, that I got it was probably three years ago. You know, but, but it is just truly remarkable material. It's pendant only because it's a little soft. It's only five to five and a half hardness, so it works well in a pendant, but so attractive. I mean, it'll just sparkle like crazy. You know, this stone is really a rare stone. I would love to have much more of it. This weighs two carat 45. Uh, the appraised value is seven ninety five. Our price five twenty, and Gem Show Two gets you that fifteen percent off. It. Next stone, another opal. Yes, I am an opalholic, um, but rightfully so because what's become available out of Ethiopia, truly amazing material, and and this stone is one of them. I mean, just look at the color, the, the fire that's in this stone, uh, this play of color. This is probably beyond what, what's known as crystal opal. This is so clear that you literally can read through it. And part of the reason crystal opal is valued because it's very difficult to have a, a, a stone that has no background, you know, like most opalers are white and have it to display such colors as are in this. You know, this has just big, broad flashes of all different colors. You know, really remarkable gem. And they're so clean. You know, there's just nothing in them. If you look at most Australian opal, you look at the back of the opal and, and you know, usually it it's, has no play of color or, you know, many of them. Um, not, nothing against Australian opal. No, don't all the Australians come after me for this. Australian opal is beautiful opal and in its finest quality um, sometimes is better than what you see in Ethiopia but when you look at a stone like this it's hard to say that anything could be better. You know, beautiful gem. Uh, this is the rough. 
This is what the rough material looks like. So this is, you know, this was a hole in the ground and it was usually some organic material that dissolved out and then the opal uh, seeped up through seams in the ground. You know, the, the opal was liquid and, you know, or, or gaseous and, and just started crystallizing out in the open voids in the ground. So this is the parent rock that's around it. But, you know, this is going to cut a great sound too. You know, but this one we're looking at uh, is pretty amazing. Uh, this opal weighs 11 carat. Uh, price value is $1,650. Our price is $1,090. Uh, so again, take 15% uh, off that with the uh, coupon gem show too. Next up, uh, Blue Zircon. We had one in last week's show. A little bigger than this, but not a better color than this. You know, this is really a, a cool color. Uh, these stones are just a, a strong, vivid blue color with a secondary accent of green, which makes them kind of a unique color, a little different than blue topaz for sure. And uh, there are aquas that will show blue with a, with a highlight of green, um, but they're pretty rare to come up with, with a, a, an aqua that has a beautiful blue-green color. That's why most aquas, we heat, uh, heat them up and get rid of the green just to leave the blue. But this is a really pretty stone, very, very deep color. You know, it's very difficult to get stones, uh, blue zircons, with this intensive color. You know, but fortunately, uh, zircon is beautiful in all of its colors because uh, it is another one that has extremely high refractive index. Uh, it's 181, again, over the ability of a refractometer to read it, uh, pushing close to, to where the diamond uh, refractive index is. Diamond's still much higher, but um, this has a diamond-like brilliance, beautiful color, uh, so a remarkable stone, and good hardness to this stone, you know, so it's a, a fairly, well, it is a durable stone, so you can wear it in rings and pendants, um, and, and feel confident that you're going to get good wear out of it. You know, this is an antique cushion. And it weighs 3.90 carats. Appraise value is $1,570. Uh, our price, $820. So again, use that coupon code to get your discount. Uh, this comes from Kampuchea. Uh, Kampuchea was formerly named Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia now a fairly safe place to go, right, Jeff? Jeff's been there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for that comment. <laughs> yes, very safe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you know, it is where they killed three million more people when Pol Pot was uh, in control there, or whatever the situation was. Um, but it was a, a very dangerous place at one time, and they laid landmines everywhere and. And um, there's still a lot of people walking around with not all their legs there. But safe place now, and, and the country's turned around, and, and they've changed the name to Campuchia. Uh, so this comes from there, and it, it's not the only source, but it's the best source for deep color. Um, we do get material out of Tanzania, uh, but some of that material can change color on you uh, when you wear it and certain types of lights can affect the color of some tanzania material you know this material is stable uh, it is heat treated um, to get to this color uh, because the original material is actually brown you know it uh, starts out brown and then they heat it up and, and alter it to this color our next stone this is this is an old, old stone in my inventory. I bought this in Bangkok, probably in, in 2005 or somewhere around then. Maybe even later than that, a lot earlier than that. Uh, because this material is, whoop, skipped one, sorry. Out of order, we'll get back to that one. Okay, next one. This is one that came out of the oven in the recent earlier video. Uh, this is the smallest of the bunch that came out of there. This weighs 2 carat 21. 
Um, it is, this cut is, not sure what this cut is. It's antique cushion. Uh, it's all step cut antique cushion. Step cut just means that the facets run like steps up the back. As you can see, I've been cutting a lot of step cuts lately. I've got to work at cutting something else, but I'm hooked on step cuts. They just come out really beautiful. You know, it's uh, relatively easy for me to cut step cuts. I've cut so many. Um, they get good yield and produce very good brilliance. Uh, and you can do it in uh, this style in any shape. Um, you can cut a step cut. So when you've got the extra depth, a step cut's always good to do, particularly in tanzanite, because it shows the color real well. Um, it, it's a cut that doesn't have the most brilliance, but, but it, it just shows the color remarkably well. Uh, this stone uh, weighs 221. Uh, praise value is 2020. Our price 1260. And with Gem Show 2, you're going to get that extra 15% off. <laughs> oh, that one sold. Cool. Thank well, you. The, uh, yeah, the Sveen. The sold. Sveen. Yes. Ah, Sveen the Sveen sold. sold. All right. Well, thank you much. You'll enjoy that stout. Cool yeah, stout. it's really, really a beauty. All right. Now back to the Spessart type. Um, this material hasn't been available for a long time. Uh, this particular source is from Namibia. It's the original source, uh, not the original source. Back uh, when I first started, I was buying material from the, uh, let me think of the name of it, uh, Little Three Mine, which is in California. Uh, Little Three Mine produced material, not quite this color. It was more like what we got later out of, uh, out of, Nigeria, but Little Three Mine really produced some cool stuff. It's near Ramona, California, but but this material came out uh, probably the 1990s in Namibia. Uh, what what makes it a little different and not really showing in this picture, but there's a little bit of peachy color to the orange uh, that this stone has. This shows it a little better. Um, like, like you would see maybe in, in an imperial topaz. Again, this is another stone always has inclusions in it, at least this source. Um, as, but in person, it just doesn't show up. You know, this video is going to show the inclusions so dramatic that uh, you just don't see it visually when you just look at the stone. Um, but this is a big stone for this particular source and a rare stone just because it's not producing anymore, to my knowledge. I haven't seen material from here for 10 years at least, uh, maybe 15. You know, but a unique thing happened. Oh, fewer question. I, I can interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, Alberto wants to know, he's noticed that some specertites seem to have bubbles in them, yeah. like the Mandarin ones. Is that true for all of them? Uh, true for Mandarin, true for... Tanzanian, um, Nigeria, and Madagascar produce much cleaner material. Uh, Nigeria was a really good source because it was clean and a really pretty color. Uh, you don't see much out of Nigeria anymore. Um, but, but most of these, particularly if you're looking at these, it, it's impossible to photograph. You know, stones that have inclusions. You know, I've got so many nice specertites. I try to photograph them and I just quit. I just I won't show them because they they show everything. They're just there's just all this small stuff that in the photograph shows up, whereas if you look at them in person, it just doesn't show up. And it's the reason you don't see emeralds on my site because they're impossible to photograph. Most rubies with veils and stuff that are in them, you know, and they look eye clean to the naked eye, but when you photograph them, it just it just kills your ability to sell them online. So that's what you're going to see here. And um, it's just a, a really a beautiful stone. Uh, and it's unfortunate we can't photograph it. I sell a lot more here in the store 
because when you look at it with the naked eye, you just don't see all that stuff that's in it. If you look at this little photograph, this is more what you're going to see. You're just not going to see the the inclusions like you see them with the with the lens I have. I use a, a 180 macro lens and and strong lights and you, there's hiding. You can't hide anything. It's just not possible to hide it. So this is really a beautiful stone. It's a rare gem. Uh, this particular stone weighs 3 carat 87. Uh, the appraised price is $4,850. Our price $2,150. Um, and again, 15% off for, for the gem show. But I, I was mentioning um, there's been situations like with the, the Sveen that we just sold uh, where one source runs out, which when this Namibian source runs out, I mean, it was like within a year three different sources, it was like they were producing them. I'm going, what the hell is going on here? You know, the uh, Madagascar was producing, uh, Nigeria and Tanzania, all within a very short period of time, just started producing, you know, from new pockets that had never been found before. You know, it's kind of crazy. It's happened in Ruby just recently, uh, where the Mangshu deposit in, in uh, Burma quit producing, and within a very short time, uh, Mozambique starts producing and just replaces the, the um, availability which ran out in, in Burma and, and then uh, uh, Mozambique starts producing. So it's good for us in the business, but it's just kind of remarkable that that can happen. You know, you have deposits that have sat there for millions of years or, and, and all of a sudden within a short period of time, one deposit runs out and we find an, a brand new deposit. Yeah. Um, let's see. One thing I wanted to mention, um, as far as uh, I have some book reviews, um, there's a, a, a very nice gentleman named Richard Wise, who I respect very much in the business. Uh, he's produced the uh, some great magazines and, and he's a really good gemologist and um, it really understands his stones. He's produced a couple of books that I've read and I, I appreciate and I think those of you that are really into gems will appreciate both of these. And, and this is the first one, it's Secrets of the Gem Trade. Uh, there is a new, new version of this, uh, mine's fairly old, but um, he, he just has a way about him about describing um, gems and just a very romantic way. He speaks of gems much better than I do, but we think the same, you know. So I recommend this book highly. It's, uh, I'm sure it's available on Amazon or anywhere you buy books. Um, it, it, uh, it is one worth owning for sure. And he's also written another book called The French Blue. Um, if you're interested in travel and gems, uh, this is a, a really good book to read. It's uh, about Jean-Baptiste Tavernier um, and his travels. He traveled in the early 1600s. Can't imagine what it was like to travel then. I love travel myself, but um, travel in the 1600s from France to um, India and, and, uh, and uh, Iran, Persia. Uh, where, where he was traveling to had to be a remarkable trip. Um, back then, uh, the diamond mines had just been discovered uh, in India, and he was really the first to describe that. Uh, he would buy uh, his gems and go back to sell to the royalty. Um, what's pictured here is uh, the French blue, uh, which I think at the time may have been 120 carats recut at least once, maybe a couple of times, and became the Hope Diamond, which is now in the Smithsonian. So that's part of this book, is the discussion of finding that and bringing it back and selling it to uh, King Henry the 14th. I'm not sure. Read the book. Yeah, it's been a while since I read it, but really good book. So a couple of things uh, that you into that are into gems uh, might enjoy reading, particularly got plenty of time to read right now. Our next stone. Did I finish that one? I think so. 
Tourmaline, Michael? Yes. Okay, this is a Congo tourmaline. Uh, Congo Democratic Republic of Congo is producing a lot of tourmalines, a wide variety of colors at this time. Um, and this is really a, a attractive blue-green. You know, of the greens, the blue-greens are, are more desirable. Um, a plain green will have a little less value than one that has a little bit of blue to it. Um, there are tourmalines that are all blue, called indicolites. Usually they're mostly blue with a little green. Uh, this is mostly green with a little blue. Uh, both are desirable. Uh, so this is coming from Congo. Uh, this particular cut, this is a Berrien style cut that I've done on this. It has a step cut crown. Uh, this particular stone weighs 4.25 carat. Uh, praise value of $2,390, our price $1,275. So really pretty stone, nice clean stone. Uh, this has an overall quality rating of 913. So really, really, really nice stone. Here's a piece of Congo rough, not the same color, but this is rough tourmaline. You know, and the, the lines that run down the side of this are kind of indicative of tourmalines. So pretty easy to ID. This is going to cut just a light green stone. And uh, what's the viewer question there, Jeff? Right. We've got a few questions about this, but okay. and I know you've got videos on YouTube that people can watch, but as far as like cutting stones, is there a machine you recommend? Somebody had mentioned, um, you know, butcher this, I'm not a gem cutter, but Facetron, Facetron? Facetron, right. yeah. Yeah, Facetron's a good machine. Um, my brother used one for years. Uh, my brother, Larry, used to be our primary cutter. I was on the road selling to jewelers and he was doing the cutting back here. He used the Facetron for years. Um, they're training in Tanzania on Facetrons. Um, the problem with my machines is they're both out of production. You know, I have an Imperial um, Alpha Taurus, uh, which I love that machine, and I also have a Facet, um, very, very accurate machi machine. Um, neither one of them is made right now. Facet is trying to come back into production, um, and hopefully they do. That's a, a great machine, but it's probably more like $6,000. Uh, the Facetron is under $3,000. Um, so it's probably the machine of choice. Uh, I know it works well. Um, the other one is Ultratech that's still manufactured that a lot of people use, and I know that's an accurate machine. Um, so difficult situation right now, you know, the, uh, my machines, I have a hard time with repair parts and, you know, it, it's difficult. So hopefully they, they last a long time. Uh, but I would, if I had a choice, I'd probably buy the Ultratech, uh, just because it does have an attachment, uh, that they build to do the, um, concave facets which I'd like to try you know and uh, that's a machine that has both available but uh, price wise uh, Facetron would probably be the choice all right thank you our next stone is a white zircon so white zircon back in the 40s 1940s um, was the diamond imitation of choice. And you can see why. Uh, this one I cut very similar to how diamonds are cut. It's a little different in that I have an extra row of facets on the back, and, and it has 16 mains rather than 8 mains. But it creates a really sparkly gem. And again, uh, the high refractive index that Zircon has is what gives you the great brilliance, what gives you diamond-like brilliance. So this is a stone that for a fraction of the price of diamond, a small fraction of the price of diamond, uh, you get a diamond-like look in a natural gem. Uh, this is not to be confused with cubic zirconia, 
Uh, zircon is a natural stone on its own. Um, so, you know, just kind of a, a cool look that uh, most people, when they look at it, they're just going to assume it's a diamond. You know, this material comes from Singita. This, I, I bought this material on our last trip to uh, Tanzania. Uh, they told me that you can heat it and it can get a little close to white, but um, mostly they're heated after a peach color or, or the golden color that, that uh, you get out of it. Uh, I haven't had a lot of luck getting peach color out of them or uh, the golden color is kind of not the prettiest color. So I heated it more and uh, actually got it to go totally white. Uh, these hit colors uh, that we would categorize in diamond as near colorless. You know, the, the GHIJ colors. Um, and I think this one hit, hit up into that range. So really a beautiful stone that came from this rough. Oh, I probably should have had a light, but um, so it's brown to start with. And then you heat it. I don't remember. It's it's well over a thousand degrees. Could have been, I, I, I've had got it in my notes, but I'm not sure what temperature, but, but it'll, it'll go colorless. Not all the zircons can you heat to colorless. Uh, most of them won't. They're just some off color. They'll go to yellows, and this material will go yellow too. Uh, and and it, it'll go from brown to lighter brown, sometimes peach, and then to yellow, and then heat it higher, and it'll go colorless. So this particular stone, I think the uh, praise uh, praise price four ten, three hundred thirty bucks. Um, and 15% off that, you know, it's still, you know, still two and a half, three hours to cut the stone, uh, but uh, really extraordinary brilliance. And I've had good success at selling them. You got a question, Steve? Uh huh. Question. So sticking with zircon, um, Jacob wants to know if honey zircon is valuable. Well, honey would be the color I just showed you. That rough that I heat to white would be the honey zircons. Uh, they're the least expensive of the zircons, you know, typically under 100 a carat. Sometimes 50 to 100 a carat is kind of where the honey zircons. You know, it really depends on, you know, honey doesn't have any of the peach color. When you get a little peach color to it, they get more valuable and much more saleable. Uh, so the honey colors, all this material I bought from Singita would heat to, uh, well not heat, I mean you just cut them and they're honey colors. They'll be from a dark brown to a honey color. You heat them a little bit, even the dark brown ones will turn that honey color. So it is the least expensive of the zircons, but still a very pretty stone. So just not for me, you know, a stone that's 200 bucks is hard to sit down five hours and and cut it four or five hours. So I don't really cut the for honey zircon. I cut for the more valuable zircon colors. Okay. But even the honeys, the brilliance is is remarkable. So if it's cut right, it can be a beautiful stone. If it's not cut right, it's worth thirty bucks a carat. But when they're cut really nicely, the value goes up, and you can hit as high as a hundred a carat on them. Okay. And uh, one um, kind of question here from Ranji. Um, is there, I guess, an overall question about heating stones that are already cut versus not cut? And is there any danger heating stones after it's been cut? Well, there's less danger because usually you cut out the stuff that's going to break. You know, if you know you're going to heat it, you try and cut them clean uh, because anything that's in them has the risk of expanding, particularly if it's a liquid, it's going to expand and crack. Uh, some solids will expand and crack. Uh, gases will expand and cause cracks. So just depends on the type of inclusion. Um, but if you cut it clean, you know, particularly zircon. Zircon will take so much heat. You know, I put them directly on a, a hot plate and heat that hot plate to red hot. That gets to about 900 degrees. And that's, that's how I heat most of the, the zircons that are peach color. Well, I'm after peach color. You know, that's the problem with these 
zircons from Singida. You know, you heat them on a hot plate when typically uh, other zircons I've cut, you heat on a hot plate and, and they end up a uh, beautiful peach color. Uh, these material from Singida, I heat and it comes off and I go, oh yeah, that's a cool stone. It's a beautiful peach color. Set it on my desk and an hour later it's a brown, you know, or it's, a, it's the honey color. The peach just left it. So that's when I started heating these to colorless because I couldn't get the right color out of Singita material that I wanted, that peach color that's worth triple what the honey color is. So. Our next stone is a sapphire. I don't have many sapphires, but the, this came from a friend who was retiring and he was selling off all his collection. And uh, this is a really nice yellow sapphire and this one is pretty much yellow you know it's a little golden color but it's not like most of the yellow sapphires that are almost to an orange color um, this is a really a beautiful yellow color it weighs four carat 21 uh, really bright uh, for a sapphire very clean stone uh, this weighs 421 the praise price is 69.90 our price of 35.60 um, and again, 15% off with Gem Show 2. Uh, this does come from Sri Lanka. Just a, a nice, pretty round, it's a step cut pavilion and a, a brilliant style crown, which worked very well. As you can see, the, the brilliance of the stone is just really, really nice and, and such a great color. You know, it's hard to find these that are so yellow. You know, this is a little golden tone to it, but really a good yellow sapphire. Uh, most yellow sapphires I've owned, people say, is that yellow? Yeah, it looks orange to me, and most of them are kind of orange. And our next stone, just really, really, really rare. But before that, we have a question. Yeah, I'm going to cut in here. <laughs> um, and th this is, I think, uh, questions that have come in. But with the, you know, a lot of people think that sapphire just comes in blue. You just showed a yellow one. What are, is there a cause that makes them different colors? Or what's the reasoning behind the different colors of sapphire? Well, it, it's usually the trace elements that are in them, you know, that cause the color. You know, the uh, blue sapphires, titanium, um, back when, in the early 80s, you know, when I was wholesaling, um, the uh, material that was found in Sri Lanka, they called it Gouda, Gyuda. Uh, the Sri Lankans were wondering why the heck all the Thais were buying all this material, you know, because it was just ugly gray. You know, and come to find out uh, after years, they finally figured out what they were doing. They were heating it up. Uh, that gray, which was caused by silk, which was titanium, um, they were dissolving that silk and it was spreading into the stone and that caused the blue color. So we had this grayish, maybe slightly blue colored stone, but mostly gray that was turned beautiful blue just by heating the material. So it is the trace elements, the different trace elements in the stone that, that cause the color. I'm not sure what the yellow, whether it's manganese or just what's causing it, but, but each color has a different trace element that's giving it its color. You know, just like with diamond, we are talking about uh, the French blue, the blue diamond, uh, that's caused by boron in the crystal. Whereas yellow diamonds is caused by nitrogen. So any yellow diamond or even an off-carat white diamond, the off-color that's typically yellow, is uh, a nitrogen that's it's in the crystal lattice of the stone. And the next stone I'm showing you that I was telling you was so rare. This is a really a, a unique piece. There we go. Uh, again, this is a tanzanite. This is a natural tanzanite. Um, what's unique about it is the colors you see in it. When you look at the stone, it has every color of the rainbow in the stone. 
I'd only seen this once before. Uh, this was back in the early 90s. I'd cut a stone and, and it just had all these rainbow colors like an opal. Um, and this is a natural color. And typically, you know, we looked at the other stone that had the blues in it, but, but this, if you catch the light right, I'm not sure this light's gonna do it for us. But if you go back to the, the original picture, Mike, you can, you can see all the colors that are in it. And uh, so we're gonna keep this stone natural because I always regretted heating the, the stone that uh, it was a 50 carat stone that had all these colors in it. You know, this is just a beautiful natural color and, and just totally unique. There's no other stone that looks like this. You know, on the planet at this time, this is one of the rarest stones that exists. You know, you'll have a hard time finding another one like this. It's been, what now, 30 years since I saw one? Um, so it, it's, it's a pretty rare stone. I've cut a lot of tanzanites. Back then, I'd taken that stone and uh, I went to see this gentleman uh, who, uh, he was president of the GIA and uh, went out to see him, to show him this stone. You know, they're in LA. I took the flight out there just because I knew I had something special and showed it to him. And he sent me to Tino Hammond, who was probably the most famous photographer at the time. And uh, unfortunately with 35 millimeter camera, they couldn't capture it. You know, we'd hope that uh, we'd get it in the uh, their trade journal for GIA, uh, which is uh, Gems and Gemology, uh, which is this magazine. And we'd hope to get pictures in there, but they just couldn't photograph it, photograph it. So at the time, nobody cared about natural, so I had to heat the stone, and, and it became a beautiful stone, but not with the unique character that this a stone like this has. You know, this is really a special stone, weighs 29.63 carats, uh, praise value of 35550 bucks. Our price is just $23,704. Again, you get 15% off it, and it's one of those stones that I have a hard time discounting it because I know it's special. You know, there's just nothing like this on the planet at this time. You know, it's really, truly a one-of-a-kind stone. And if you chose to heat it, which would be a crime, um, it will heat to top color. I mean, this will just be an amazing gem. Most of the tanzanites you can judge by the depth of color of it. Um, you know, so uh, there's no question that this will be as good of a heated stone as exists. You know, just a, a remarkable stone heated, but it'll never be heated. Not while I own it, anyway. Now we have a couple of opals. We had some of these, uh, one, one bigger opal in the show last week. Um, and, and these are pear-shaped opals that come to us from uh, uh, Madagascar. You know, this was when I took trips to Madagascar, I could always buy nice aquas there. Uh, according to the, the cutter in Madagascar I bought these from, uh, it's no longer the case. They're much more difficult to get. But what I've always liked about the aquas of Madagascar is their pure blue color. No real secondaries that detract from the beauty of the stone. Uh, but this is a, a match pair uh, make a great pair of earrings, you know, just really a great color. It's just a tiny bit of green that that really highlights the beauty of the stone, uh, but none of the gray like you'd see in, in stones from Mozambique, uh, just a, a nice pure blue color. Um, so these stones have an appraised value of $1,470, our price six fifty, dollars and again with the code GEMSHOW2, you'll get another 15% off these. These will make a, a great pair. You know, even though they don't weigh much, aqua's very light, so you get a, a good size to it. I mean, these are 10 millimeters long, six millimeters wide. Um, so, so they're big enough for a ring, uh, big enough for a pendant, you know, or great for a pair of earrings. 
Aqua is a real tough stone, so you can put it in any type of jewelry and, and not worry about wearing it. You know, one thing about Aqua, if you own it, um, Aqua and um, Morganite, uh, which is the same stone. You know, they're pale stones, they have low refractive index, so when you have Aquas and, and Morganites, you really need to keep them clean. Uh, very, very important because refractive index, as well as determining brilliance, it also determines how well a stone will hold up to the dirt and grit that you get on these stones. And when the backs get uh, covered with oils or grease, you know, it just kills the brilliance. You know, you really have to work at keeping uh, those two stones particularly uh, very, very clean. You know, if you want them to show to their best, they'll lose their color and lose their brilliance if you don't keep them clean. So th this is a really nice cluster of aquas. These are a little different formation than you typically see aqua in, but really cool crystal. You know, and this is actually available on Michael's website, which is mineralmike.com. He deals mostly in mineral specimens. And this is a really cool piece. Both sides, crystals growing. So, so this was the wall um, between two open cavities. And the liquids filled the cavities and, and these crystals grew in both directions. You know, quite an unusual piece to see like this. You know, just really nice terminations and shapes to the crystals. Uh, this crystal comes from Brazil. Again, they're available on mineralmike.com. Next stone is another remarkable gem. Hey, Steve. Yes. Oh, Popping sorry. up here. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Um, with the aquas that were just shown, uh -huh. um, Donna wants to know, they look kind of big, and you recommended earrings. Yeah. Is there any way you can uh, kind of display them against your against yeah, they're the ear? Not, or? Yeah, they're not big. They're bigger than the weight suggests. I was going to reweigh them because they just look bigger than that, but they're small. Yeah, let me put them on my petite ears, you know. I don't know if you can see that or if you drop them. So it's really a good earring size. Look good, w would they look good? Yeah. I don't know. Should I put diamonds with them? Or? <laughs> she should own them. Yeah, nightstones. Our next stone is another tanzanite. You know, moregems.com is our, our website for most of the colored stones you see tonight, but the tanzanites is a complete separate uh, website, tanzaniteJewelryDesigns.com. Tanzanite's 50% of our business. Um, a remarkable selling stone, um, and for good reason. It's beautiful color. I mean, if you had a sapphire like this that weighed 12 carat 57, I could probably look it up in the book real quick and see what it'd be worth, but it'd be a quarter million dollars. You know, here you got a stone that's uh, uh, ninety-four hundred dollars, and it can be fifteen percent off. It's an eight thousand dollar stone compared to that sapphire that's a quarter million dollars. You know, so really uh, remarkable value in a tanzanite. There's not a prettier gem on the planet. You know, the characteristic of this material is most of them in daylight will appear more blue and in incandescent light will appear more violet. This particular stone is mostly blue, uh, doesn't have as strong a change uh, to the violet, uh, which is a, a rarer color. I won't say it's more desirable because I, there's very few that are all blue. I mean, this has a little bit of violet to it, but uh, it's, it's mostly a blue gem. This I did in a step cut. A little bit of dust off the top. Yep. Totally clean stone. 
it's kind of a parallelogram. And I can't get all the dust off. But anyway, it's a step cut pavilion and crown. Again, it works very well for showing the color of this stone, as you can see. So not quite a diamond shape, just kind of a pushed over rectangle. You know, cool cut to set. You know, it would do real well in a ring, big ring, but uh, not too big, or a great pendant, you know. So the overall quality rating of this stone is about as high as you can get. It's a 990. Um, so very near perfect in my opinion. Our next gem is a, an amethyst. You know, last week we had Rwanda amethyst, which I consider to be the finest amethyst on the planet. But this is a close second. Um, Rwanda, again, it's a situation where one runs out and uh, another uh, takes its place. Uh, in 2016, the Rwanda ran out. Uh, this material we got in 2018, I believe. Forgive the picture. I sure didn't get that stone clean very well but uh, it is totally clean stone uh, this material came large and very clean and the color just shows uh, that good dichroism or pleochroic colors that you like to see in material where it shows reds with the violet and some lights it shows more blue with the violet um, this is not a portuguese cut but a variation of it uh, so it, it's a Portuguese with less facets, but although it looks brilliant like a Portuguese cut. Uh, the stone weighs 19.89 carat, praise value of 1790, our price is 850. So even though this is very close to Rwanda material, uh, quality wise the price is significantly less because the Rwanda material hit seventy eighty dollars a carat you know and this is probably forty or so yeah forty then then we're going to discount it so you know so you get a lot of bang for the buck you know really pretty colors really well cut and and not very expensive actually as inexpensive as you can get colored stones for generally so really a nice round brilliant. Here's the rough for this material. Uh, wish I had a pen light. But you can kind of catch the color. I don't know if I should move this, but no, uh, hard to see the color, but I didn't come prepared with the, with the right light to show you. But it is great material, nice size material. I have uh, probably another 10 of these stones to cut. There you can get a fairly good idea what it looks like. But th these came out of Bahia, Brazil. Um, yeah, late, was it, was it 2018 we yeah, got these? 2019. It was 19. September. Okay, September 2000. No, that would have been last fall. Was that when we got them? Okay. Okay. So we got them last fall. Um, cool stuff. You know, we've cut a lot of great amethyst. Again, not my favorite to cut because it's difficult to polish. You know, some stones will polish just fine for you, and the next one is just a pain in the butt. They just tend to, to scratch easily or get... Um, What's it called in paint is uh, uh, orange peel. Yeah, so it's hard to, to get a real fine finish on the stones. But this one has a really fine finish. You'll be happy with it. I'm happy with it. I work on them till I get them right. It just takes time. 
All right. Uh, another question, Good Jeff. Question. Thanks. Um, this is from Dakota Stones. Um, he was here last week as well. Does a 600 grit lightning lap work for a pre-polish? I heard they that they polish like a 1200. Um, I have yet to use the lightning. I think they're a lot like what I use. I use new bonds, but they don't make those anymore. I've bought some lightning. I haven't used them yet. So let me know how they work. Um, I'm trying to think I bought pink ones. I don't know if it's 1200 or 600 because my new bond lap is a 325 and many of these stones I've gone direct from that new bond 325 to polish. Um, how those numbers relate, you know, 325 is actually a pretty coarse grid if it were a diamond lap, which new bond is a diamond lap, but a standard diamond lap 325, you would never go to polish from that. Uh, but my new bond is probably more like an 1800, even though it's rated as 325 diamond. It's like an 1800, and you can go to polish from that. So let me know how it works for you. I'll be interested. Um, I would think it's real similar to new bond. So maybe the, when you say 600, maybe that'll, that'll work. Um, definitely give it a try. I'm all for the fewer steps in cutting uh, the better. So yeah, I was going to say, um, could you translate that for all of us non-jump cutters? Well, the grits are just like sandpaper. You know, that's how it's all rated like a sandpaper. And, you know, these grits, they're, they're diamond that are in our laps. Um, a coarse grit is, say, a 180 um, grit. You know, just like um, if you're doing a car, you probably start at, I don't know, 220 sandpaper, go to 400 or 600, and some of the the pre, uh, the the finest grit sandpaper you can get is maybe a thousand. Maybe you can get cor cor or less coarse than that. As the bigger the number gets, the the less coarse it is. When I final finish. Uh, with diamond in my polishing, I'm up to 50,000, which is very, very fine diamond powder that produces a, a scratch like half the wavelength of light, or you know, it produces a very, very fine scratch. And that's how diamonds cut and polish by scratching, you know. So once you get to a fine enough scratch, it's no longer apparent to the eye and, and appears as a, a brightly polished surface, but that takes the 50,000 diamond to get that, that kind of polish. So I'm going from a 325 to a 50,000, uh, which is a big spread, and, and typically most cutters with diamond, uh, most diamond laps, they, they'll go from 3,000 to polish maybe, but this 325, just the way it's made and what, what, it's, what it's into, creates a very fine finish and, and allows me to polish from 325, which is, um, wouldn't be normally considered a, a normal way to step into to finishing. Hopefully that made some sense to somebody. If not, go to our cutting videos on YouTube and you'll get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. Our next stone is another tanzanite. We are featuring tanzanite tonight. Um, and, and it's a, a really unique cut. Um, it's probably these long cuts are just the easiest to sell once mounted because they always look unique. You put this in a ring or put it in a pendant, and no matter what you do to it, it has a unique look. Uh, you can set it plain, you can put diamonds around it, you can accent the sides of it. Um, whatever you do is is a different looking piece just because of the shape of the stone, you know. So so it's a it's a stone that if I had more opportunity to cut stones this shape, I would. You know, stones like aquas and tourmalines you know, will more often come this kind of shape. Um, but as you can see with this this crystal of tanzanite, which is available on Mineral Mike. Um, you can see this would cut this kind of shape, uh, but, but usually the material is not available for these long cuts. You know, there's always something in it as there is in this stone. 
you know, you'll see the inclusions that don't allow you to cut a long, clean stone. So you're working in sections in between and getting shorter stones. But getting a long length of width stone like this is always a, a plus because I know they're going to sell. They're just good sellers, uh, particularly mounted. Sometimes people look at this long shape and go, oh, what would you do with that? But you put it into a pendant or a ring, and they don't ask what you're going to do with it. They just ask how much because it's, it's just a really attractive-looking piece. So this stone is a 3 carat 14. Overall quality rating is 942. A really clean stone and really well cut. Uh, because the color is not the deepest color for tanzanite, it still hits the vivid range. Um, so it's a very pretty color, but it took the, the rating down a little bit because otherwise if it had a perfect color, it'd be the perfect stone. Uh, but a 942 is a very high rated stone on our grading system. And next is the uh, only piece of jewelry we have on the show. We'll probably do more jewelry in the future because that's, for most of us, that's what it's all about anyway, um, is, is ultimately getting these pieces into a, a piece of jewelry. This was designed by my nephew, Christopher Michael. Um, just a really cool piece. I think we originally did this as an engagement ring, but it just worked out really well with, for this Savorite. Uh, Savorite garnet is the green form of garnet that comes, uh, this particular stone is from Tanzania. Um, a lot of them come from Kenya also. You know, this was originally discovered by Campbell Bridges, uh, who I met um, back in the early 80s. Um, I was doing a gem show for a jeweler in uh, Peoria, Illinois. And in walks this guy in a long trench coat and a, a leather hat and starts asking me about gems and and then started asking me about tanzanite and savorite and, you know, come to find out uh, he's Campbell Bridges, who's the discoverer of savorite. His wife uh, is from Peoria, Illinois, and he just walked in and and just started uh, giving me a hard time about everything and uh, took me to his house and showed me a lot of stones. Unfortunately, his stones were about twice what I was selling them for, so I really couldn't buy them from him. But he was the discoverer, um, just a really nice, nice person. I met his daughter and son. They were both uh, toeheads. They were just, their hair was as white as could be. And, and Bruce Bridges now, I mean, he was probably six at the time. Uh, he is running the business because unfortunately his father was killed by local miners uh, in a dispute in, in, in Kenya uh, because he originally discovered Tanzanite in, or Savorite in Tanzania, um, was kicked out of the country by the government officials um, and actually followed the uh, geology across into Kenya and actually found it there also. So he was uh, um, very, he's a famous person in our business. And uh, unfortunately, what happened uh, is a sad thing. Uh, his son has taken over the business, doing a very good job. And, you know, it's uh, just a remarkable stone because the stone has the, the color that we wish most emeralds would have, has a brilliance that emerald will never have, um, higher clarity. Uh, everything about this gem in a green stone is ideal. Um, it's less expensive than emerald. It has everything that uh, that we want in a green stone. You know, this uh, stone is is big for garnet. You know, things over two carats get into a rare size for this material. Um, so this is a two carat uh, seventy six. Uh, it's set in platinum. Uh, again, the Christopher Michael design. Uh, it's got uh, very fine diamonds accenting the, the center stone. But just look at the brilliance of the stone. You know, this color doesn't show well on the iPhone. It's, it is. What, what you'll find, uh, the videos I take and, and the pictures that are on our website are very accurate. Uh, really work hard to get the colors right. 
Uh, we don't get complaints later that the color was inaccurate. I can't be perfect every time, but but we do get uh, get the color very accurate on the size. So so what you're seeing in this picture is an accurate representation of this stone. It is a really beautiful gem and just a, a really remarkable piece uh, altogether. Uh, the next stone I'm very proud of, stone I cut, um, little different cut, uh, has a, a brilliant pavilion and, uh, and a step cut crown, but the brilliance just came out to be outstanding. And the flashes of red in this stone are like in no other tanzanite I've ever seen. Um, really just sparkles that uh, blue purple and and just strong red flash coming out everywhere in the stone yeah it is about as good as is we're gonna find in a fine tanzanite you know just so remarkably brilliant my wife commented that uh, you know we we love Portuguese cuts but she said, I like that better than the Portuguese cut. I mean, it just really has a sparkle to it. So this stone came out to be a 8 carat 27, uh, price value of $9,510, our price $6,190. And again, 15% off using the, uh, the Gem Show 2 coupon code on the site. Quick question, Steve. Yes, sir. With a lot of these stones, I've kind of seen it too, but could you maybe put them over your finger just to give them some uh -huh. relevance to size? Not, I don't know where the best place to, yeah, this is a little close, but <laughs> you can see part of my finger. Let me see if I can get to this, see if that helps. Oop. Hard working in this camera because everything's backwards. I go to brush my hair and I brush it the wrong way. So hopefully that helps. You know, I'd like to find a better way of of just showing how the size relates to something we understand. That's not necessarily my hand. I have pretty big hands, so it. Uh, Probably looks smaller than it actually would on a lady's hand. Although we've done a lot of tanzanites for gents rings. Yeah. And I have a gents tanzanite ring. I actually didn't wear any rings tonight. Sorry. I have a, well, I had a beautiful opal ring, but we sold that this week. So, and speaking of opals, uh, I think this is our last stone. And I won't say I saved the less for best for last, but uh, this is among the finest I've ever seen. Uh, this opal has colors that just blow me away. I mean, I've never seen such colors in an opal. I mean, just look at it. This is a faceted opal. <clears throat> I, I, after looking at this again, I said I, I shouldn't do anything but facet opals because they just come out so remarkable. Uh, not that all material is transparent enough to really have a, a real benefit from faceting, but but I think a lot of it shows real well faceted, and, and faceted opals sell for us better than probably any other style of opal. Uh, and this one is just spectacular. I mean, if, if you look at every side of this stone, it just has a, a beauty to it that, that I've never seen in an opal. This, again, top crystal opal is probably what the category would be. I mean, it's just high transparency, you know, and if we catch the light right, you can, I don't know if we're going to see it, you know. But when they're faceted, you will catch a red coloration from the back of the stone, actually from the facets, uh, that reflect a, a body color. Uh, that is slightly red in these stones. So the faceting actually does some addition of color to the opal. 
um, the other picture is probably a better picture of this opal because when you photograph these, if you are a photograph photographer, I found you've got to have the lights far away from the stone because it just, um, when the light's close, it just distorts the, the color pattern. It kind of diffuses the pattern. Uh, you don't get the, the same play of color as you do when the lights are further away. But really a beautiful stone, just totally clean, uh, completely faceted. And this stone, uh, price of twenty-two fifty, appraised price of thirty-six ten. Uh, but just a, a one-of-a-kind opal, you know, it's something of this quality you just never see. I mean, I've never seen something uh, like this. You know, I've had this stone for a while. I've been wanting to mount it up. Um, but we've just been so busy doing custom work for sold jobs that we rarely get a time to uh, put things together. So I finally decided to to do this as a, as a loose stone, offer it out. Hopefully we can make a mounting for you. Any of these stones, if we sell them, of course we, uh, we specialize in custom work. Yeah, let's see if give you an idea of size on this. Well, hard to work with these, this camera. And this little camera is definitely not made for showing stones. But there's the size of it, so it'd make a Good sized pendant. But the color, no matter what direction you look from front or back, it's just full of color. So a really special opal. Comes to us from Wilo, Ethiopia. Um, like I say, the stone's been cut for some time and uh, completely stable, you know, and that's what you're going to find. Those first two opals, I did some hydrophane testing on them, um, being this stone, this big one, and this stone. Uh, just this morning, I, I started thinking about hydrophane. Hydrophane is what this material is, meaning it likes water, so it'll absorb water. Um, which is a very good asset because the biggest problem with uh, opals, particularly from Australia and, and other sources, is as they dry out, um, they will tend to crack, just like uh, clay cracking as it dries out. Um, opals generally have a, a, fair, a percentage of them have, have, well, they all have some water in them. And the higher the water can content, the more likely they are to craze. Crazing is drying out and forming cracks in the stone. And I've seen opals 20 years old craze because somebody left them in a window and the sun got to them and, and caused sudden drying out. Um, but hydrophane opal, like these Wheelow opals, don't have that issue. Uh, they can take on water, lose the water, and never craze. Um, you know, these stones that, uh, I've cut, you know, once they're cut and have been cut for a day, I have yet to see a stone craze. That may be a little exaggeration, but almost never do they craze, you know, and, and the hydrophane character, the only drawback to it, um, is that they can also absorb oils and things you get on them. And you don't want to get oils and, and dyes and chemicals because it will absorb these. But those first two opals, I did a hydrophane test on them. And, and uh, you know, you can literally put a little drop of water on the stone. And stones that are highly hydrophane, you can literally watch in seconds. They'll suck up that little drop of water. Uh, those two stones, they, after minutes, they hadn't sucked up anything. So they're a very low hydrophane character. So I, I, I think that also means that they're not going to absorb oils and, and chemicals as quickly. So maybe they're more durable in, in that standpoint. 
you know, the durability of these opals has been tested by GIA, where they did drop tests, and the Wheelow opals withstood drop tests better than all other sources. So Wheelow opal, in general, for an opal, uh, has greater durability than most sources. Uh, so if there's no more questions, I think uh, I've gone through our stones. Oh, there is a question, so... What's yes, your question? It's, it's question time. So we're going right. to run down the questions. If anybody has any more, just go ahead and post them. But we'll try to get to some that um, people had earlier. So um, one question was on the investment in Tanzanite, especially that large one that you showed. Um, what do you feel about investing in Tanzanite? Well, Tanzanite is the only stone that I've ever told people that I thought was a good place to put their money. Um, tanzanite, you know, how long it's going to take, who knows. Uh, um, it is such a small, it's a finite amount of material that's available. Right now the government's getting deeply involved and the only thing I can see is prices have to go up. I think the stone is underpriced. Um, it's, it's limited availability. You know, the mine that I go down into, they're down 1,200 meters. Um, and the deeper you go looking for material, the more expensive it gets to, to produce that material. And it is possible that one day they're just going to run out. And most people predict that no more than 20 years or so that, that this material is going to run out. But the one thing you know in mining is you don't know what's ahead. could be a year from now. Who knows what's further down the, in the hole uh, more material or no more material, hard to say. But the only thing I can see for Tanzanite is the price going up. You know, just how long it's going to take and how long you got to invest in it. You know, you're not going to invest in this material and think in two years you're going to uh, make a lot of money. Although it is possible, just particularly now with the situation with the government, uh, really stepping in, you know, the price has to go up because of the way the marketing is. It's no longer smuggled across the, the border into Kenya. Um, and, and it's now going through dealers uh, that are licensed, dealers that now have to pay tax on it. So I can only see that the price is going to go up just how much only time will tell. With all investments, you just don't know. But in the gemstone industry, I see it as being the best investment you could make. Um, the only other place I see investment in this business is anytime there's a new supply, um, because new supplies are typically very finite, very short-lived, and that's another place to invest in this business. But the place to put money, in my opinion, and the place I'm putting it is in Tanzanite. Um, so yes, I think Tanzanite is is a good investment, but we know how investments are and you just don't know, but you also have a beautiful gem that right now is as cheap as it's going to be for, or cheap as it's been in all my time in business. You know, back in the early 80s, uh, Tanzanite wholesale for 3000 a carat. Now we're looking at 500 a carat, 600 high-end 700 a carat um, for really top, top goods. You know, you have stones like this that are one of a kind and one day will be a one of a kind. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of things that uh, we look for in all investments is something that has great rarity, great beauty, and that's where I find Tanzanite. In, in, any other? Yep, a few other okay. ones, um, just looking as they come in here. Can you, um, one, uh, Savannah had a few questions about, have you heard of Spencer Opal? Yes, I've heard of Spencer Opal. Can I think what the heck it is at the moment? Spencer <laughs> Opal. I, I, you know, if I were going to guess, it's some kind of uh, man-made. Um, it's been so long since I heard that term, but... If I were a betting man, I'd say it's it's a man-made opal. Okay. But don't quote me on that. 
I'm not going to go into any deeper questions about Spetsaropol. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look it up online, you you probably can find it out. But but I'm not sure what Spetsaropol is. You know, I've been only since the Ethiopian opal came out have I really got heavy into into opal. Uh, Australian opal was tough to buy reasonably, and I just I just generally couldn't see that I could make money on it. But Ethiopian opal I see is different. It's new. It's it's uh, available in big stones. I can buy the rough. I can cut it. Um, so so that's before that I really wasn't heavy into opal, and I didn't follow the opal market strongly. So Spencer opal, if you find out. Let me know, or we'll look it up if you want to give us your email, and I, I can find the information and, and, and let you know. All right, another opal question. Another sugar opal. Sugar opal. Yeah, does that it? That I know what it is. <laughs> I have one. All right, okay, so um, she's asking, does it get grainy as you cut down through the surface? I guess she's having a problem and thinking Opticon might fix it. Uh, will Opticon fix it? I'm not sure. But, you know, sugar opal is a treated opal. They use sugar and they smoke treat it and it turns a, um, a cheap white opal, you know, and that's the problem you're having. It's a low quality opal that is somewhat porous that they, they treat and it turns the color and, and uh, makes it look much more beautiful than it ever was. Um, so um, I've never cut it. You know, I have one as a sample to show people, and and it's uh, surprisingly beautiful. But the color's not totally stable, um, and I'm sure if you put it in, into any kind of uh, um, solvent, you're gonna take the color out of it. Not positive on that, but I, I think they they're not very color stable, and over time they probably lose their color too. But you can retreat them. You know, but I've seen a lot of that really grainy material, and I don't think it's something I'd want to cut. I don't, just don't think you can get a high polish on it. Okay. Good answer. Well, um, it, here's a question about a stone. We, I don't think we had it on tonight, but um, they want to know if um, irradiated blue topaz, can it glow? He has a sp stone that was cut in the 40s that glows under a black light. Hmm, not that I know of. And cut in the 40s. Uh, if it's a deep blue, like most of the blue topaz you see, there's some issue, it's something else. You know, it's not topaz at all. Um, I don't think, Michael, you remember of topaz? Fluorescence. Fluoresces, I don't remember it. I, sure, yeah. I don't yeah, I don't think it fluoresces. Uh, and, and, you know, all the blue topaz we see today that have these beautiful colors, they were produced in the early 80s, was the first I saw it. You know, I started carrying blue topaz on the road, maybe 80, it's either the late 70s or early 80s when, when the London blues came out. You know, as I, I said last week when we showed the topaz, I carried a kilo of this material with me, and it probably was just hot as could be. Because the London Blues, if you don't hold them out for six months, they retain radiation. And uh, not hazardous for a single stone, but for a guy carrying a kilo of it, it probably had some effect on me. I don't know. You know my kids might tell you more about that. <laughs> Of course, they came out okay. You know, there are no deformities or anything, so. Okay. But I'd look further into it. You send me a picture of it, maybe I can tell you more. Or, you know, there are ways of testing them. Um, that dichroscope I showed earlier probably would give some aid in it. You know, particularly if it truly, if it's actually a synthetic spinel, which would be um, a common imitation of what blue topaz might look like. Um, but the 40s would be, you know, blue topaz, other than the radiated material, is very, very light material, uh, very light in color, and so not, not those deep, vivid colors we see today. Okay. Uh, another question further back. I'm looking for it here, but it was about a, the head strap magnifier. Uh -huh. Do you have a recommendation? As far as? Like a brand or one that you like to use? Uh, or... We use Optivisor, um, 2.5 magnification if you're a cutter. 
Uh, there's a lot of different plates that you can put on them, you know, but that's probably the best. If you're talking about just the cutting or looking at gems closer, you know, Optivizer is the one we buy. I'm All sure right. it's on Amazon. Uh, you know, they're about 40 bucks, I think. Okay, let me see. I'm going through here. Um, one person asked about uh, what causes, you may have talked about this, but what causes opal to get milky? Uh, you mean after you own it? Uh, after you I own think it? so. This, uh, she's saying that she left hers on, forgot to take it off, and washed her hands. Yeah. Okay. Well, that goes away. You know, once it dries out, it'll the color will come back. If it's Ethiopian, the hydrophane, when you get them wet, uh, usually washing your hands, usually it takes longer than that. But uh, uh, I was talking about how hydrophane they are. Real hydrophane ones, you know, the they're going to absorb water quicker. So they'll turn milk white, lose their color. Um, and then over time, which can take a week, um, the color will come back. That milkiness will go away. You know, at first they get completely clear, lose all their color, go milky, and then the color comes back after a week or so. You know, it's one of the frustrating things when I cut a stone, you finish a stone, you'd love to see what it looks like, show everybody else how beautiful this stone is. And because you use water to cut it, it's just this milky looking stone that everybody go, well, why'd you cut that? You know, but then after a week or so, or, you know, it's usually three, four days, you know, I cut one, I think, uh, Monday and hoped it'd be ready for this show, but it, it's not quite dried out yet. So it hasn't shown its full beauty. So you really got to be looking at a week to get that color back. Okay. Another question, um, probably just trying to be funny here, but I uh, wanted to know what you do with the powder that you grind off. I always thought I should save it all in case there's something rare there that they find a use for. Uh, but I just scrape it out and throw it down the, into the garbage. There's no color to it. Actually. There's no color. Yeah, it's white powder. Even tanzanite. You cut tanzanite, uh, it's just a white powder. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's one I particularly thought, you know, it's rare enough. Maybe there's some reason to keep that stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, highlight opal, we tried to see if the powder would fluoresce, but it didn't either. You know, so it's, as far as I know, it's useless. And hopefully after 40 years of cutting, I didn't throw a bunch of stuff away that actually had some value. <laughs> uh, yeah, swarf is what, the, yeah, the, what, you, what you grind up, you know, because when you, you're just grinding, when you're cutting an, any stone and, so it just ends up a white powder. Why all these colored stones turn white when you cut them to powder, I'm not sure. Why they don't maintain any color, but uh, that's on the atomic level and yeah, I'm sure there's an explanation. I don't have it. All right, um, here's a question from G2. Do you see people bringing in tanzanite that have been damaged and is, it, is that a problem with tanzanite? Well, it's a problem with all stones. Any stone that uh, is, you know, sapphire hardness or less, you're going to damage. Even sapphire, you know, particularly heated sapphire, um, you can easily damage the surface. Usually it's chips rather than scratches. But the heating process, as hot as they get sapphires, uh, do cause some durability issues. And I've got a friend is is a jeweler and his wife, uh, they'd send me her sapphire to recut remarkable amount of times, you know, because they're dealing with jewelry and hitting other hard things. And, you know, just sapphire that's that are heat treated sapphires are much less durable. And I see that when I cut them because a natural sapphire that's not heated uh, polishes completely different than a heated sapphire. Uh, the heated ones, when you cut them with a coarse lap, just chips come out of them. And it takes a long time to polish through that. Whereas a natural stone, don't chip like that. They grind much smoother. So uh, there's a difference with heating. Um, you know, things like tanzanites are not heated enough for that to be an issue, but their hardness is not that great. So when you've got a hardness that is the same as 
70 percent of everything on the planet which is quartz hardness of seven so anytime you scratch the dust and uh, run against uh, things like bricks or anything hard uh, run a stone it's gonna gonna scratch a, a stone if it's seven hardness it's gonna scratch a stone at six and a half seven hardness so yes there's a lot of tanzanite out there it needs to be repolished but when you repolish you know it's only a labor thing you're not going to lose that much material because it uh, you know a five carat stone ends up a four carat 80 when you've repolished the whole crown of the stone so they can be repaired um, and after time you know i tell people that wear them as engagement rings you're gonna after five six seven years you're gonna probably need to repolish that stone if you're gonna really enjoy it all right um the last, I think, question here um, is asking about with the rubies, do you collect rubies or do you, do we have a lot of rubies? I do not have a lot of rubies. Um, I used to be much heavier in ruby when Mangshu was available at reasonable prices. Ruby prices went up so much because the Chinese, when they were buying heavily with, with all the money that they, uh, I won't get into where they got their money from but they had money they had to put into something because it was illegal money and and they really changed the whole business and they forced the prices of of rubies up so much you know i had a two carat ruby that that i had for six thousand dollars and and after a couple of years when they started investing you couldn't have touched that ruby for 20 grand so it became a situation where it was generally out of the the pricing market of, of my customer and investing in a lot of ruby became difficult a uh, little easier now with the mosaic material a little more reasonable again um, so i just bought a two carat two and a quarter carat stone but it's still it's uh over eight thousand dollars in the stone which is a limiting factor so i'm not heavy into ruby sapphire or emerald uh, just because of the high value I've gone after the stones I can cut. I can't buy ruby rough. I can't buy emerald rough in general. I've cut a few Ethiopian stones, but, um, and, and sapphire rough. When I was going to Madagascar, I was buying sapphire rough. Uh, but getting rough in those stones is difficult. They're a much more controlled market, so I've chosen to work with the other stones that are more reasonable and easier to sell to the general population. All right, um, and we'll do one last question here um, because we did feature a lot of tanzanite on the show tonight. Um, if someone's looking, is interested in buying a tanzanite, I know we have a video on this, but is there an easy way to tell um, or a hard way to tell if it's real or fake tanzanite? Okay, um, you could buy this. This is a tanzanite filter. It has a dichroscope in it. It's not like the calcite microscope I showed you, but it, it's part of this. And, and uh, this will help you separate uh, most of the imitations. Uh, there are no synthetics for tanzanite, um, but this is a real helpful tool. And again, available very inexpensively. I don't know if it's 50 bucks or it's less than that. Um, this is by the Henneman Gemological Instruments. Uh, it's a tanzanite filter. Um, and it will help you dramatically in identifying tanzanite. Is that all the questions? All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we'll be on again next Wednesday night, 7.05 p.m., same time, same place. Um, and um, possible we may feature... Not the newest stones we've got, but some of the older stones. We've got, uh, I've got a thousand plus stones. Uh, I've been cutting for more than 30 years. I've been at this for 40 years. I've got some few old friends and uh, some really great stones for one reason or another haven't sold. So maybe we'll assume its price and we'll put some great prices on them. Uh, so I think maybe next week we'll, we'll just feature some stones that, that uh, it's time to move them and get into something else. So we'll give you some really, really great prices on stones that are really nice stones. But for some reason, I've had them longer than a year and, 
you know, some stones probably five years or even more. So, uh, but I'll only pick out the best and we'll give you some great prices and maybe that'll be the focus next week. So again, thanks for coming to the More Gem Show. Uh, hope to see you weekly here. Uh, bring your friends and uh, buy some gems and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.